Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. We're taking a look today at an affordable gaming laptop from HP. This is the Victus 16, and we're going to take a closer look at what this laptop is all about in just a second, but I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure, this is on loan from HP. So when we're done with this, it goes back to them. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this gaming laptop is all about. Now the starting price on this one is around $749. That will get you an i5 processor along with an NVIDIA 1650 GPU. The one we're looking at today is about $1,250. This model comes equipped with an i7-11800H processor, an RTX 3060 GPU from NVIDIA, along with 16 gigabytes of RAM, 512 gigabytes of storage, and a 32 gigabyte Optane module installed to speed up some of the apps you might be running on the device here. There are a lot of different configuration options. So when we go into the benchmark section, I'll give you some ideas as to how some of the other models that you might find out there with this laptop will perform. This will likely be the top performing Victus uh, that you can choose from. Now you do have the ability to upgrade the RAM and storage on this. So you have two RAM slots on board. It comes equipped with DDR4 3200 RAM from the factory. It has two storage slots available also. One of those storage slots is a PCI Express 4.0 slot. That's on the right side of the unit. And the left side of the unit can take a second NVMe, but it's PCI 3 only. Now this is the first PC I received for review that has Windows 11 pre-installed from the factory. It's running great on here. All of the games that you're going to see a little later along with the benchmarks were run under the new operating system here. And I am sure we will see many more Windows 11 PCs in the weeks ahead here. Now all of the different Victus configurations have a 16.1 inch display running in a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. So even the lower end models will look similar to this one. The display on our review loaner here is a slightly higher end one. It's 1080p running at 144 hertz with 300 nits of brightness. The lower end models will have the same 1080p resolution but running at a slower refresh rate of 60 hertz and slightly dimmer at 250 nits. Now these displays do not support NVIDIA G-Sync although I didn't notice any oddities as I was playing a bunch of games on it earlier. Now the build quality isn't bad. It's made out of plastic as you would expect at this price point. The only gripe that I have with the build is that the display hinge is very wobbly as you can see here. It does hold itself in place. It's got a good amount of tension on it, but it just wobbles a lot. And that's the one thing to be aware of. As long as you keep your hands off the display, it'll stay put even when your desk is moving around, but it does uh, wobble as you're adjusting everything into place. But it is a bit on the heavy side. It's 5.4 pounds or 2.45 kilograms. It's definitely on the larger side, but again, that's what you get at the lower end of the gaming laptop market here. So altogether, not bad, it's plastic, but as you'll see in a few minutes, it performs quite well. Now the webcam is nothing to get excited about. It is a 720p camera that shoots at 30 frames per second, but it's comparable with other lower end laptops out there and you can get your Zoom calls done and whatnot. The speakers are on the bottom of the unit here. They are downward firing. You get good stereo separation. They're nice and clear, but there's not a lot of bass to them. So you'll probably want to attach gaming headphones or a headset or something. Uh, you can do that with the headphone jack or go over Bluetooth. Now, one of the advantages of having a large laptop is that you have a nice big keyboard to go with it. The keys are large and well spaced. It's easy to type on. You've got your full number pad here as well. The keyboard is backlit, although it's just a white backlight, no fancy RGB going on. No fingerprint or other biometrics available on this unit though, so you will have to type in your password to unlock. The trackpad is a little springier than I would like, but it does get the job done. But I do think the trackpad could be a little better on this one, and I've seen HP put nicer trackpads in some of their other units. Now for ports, you've got a bunch on here. Of note is a full gigabit ethernet port here with a little door that pops down to plug in your ethernet cables. You have an HDMI output, a full-size USB-A, and a USB Type-C. You can output display through the HDMI and the USB-C here. However, the USB-C does not power the laptop. You do have to use the included 200 watt power supply to power this device, but you can 
hook it up to a docking station and get your data and video going through that. You got your headphone jack here, an SD card reader over here. On the other side, we have a fan exhaust along with two more USB-A ports. Very nicely equipped here. Now this does of course have a fan on board to cool off the laptop, two of them actually and you'll want to keep the bottom of the laptop clear along with that side exhaust and the rear of the unit as well. And if you do that, it's actually going to perform pretty consistently as you'll see on a benchmark test that we'll look at in a few minutes. The fan noise isn't bad on this. I've heard gaming laptops that are significantly louder. Uh, the fan is certainly audible when you're playing a game or putting the computer under heavy load, but it doesn't have as much of a high-pitched whine to it as some other gaming laptops do. So I was relatively pleased actually with the level of fan noise that you, you'll hear out of this under significant load. The battery life though is not great. If you are not playing games and kind of stick into the basics like web browsing and email and word processing, you're looking at probably about six hours or so of longevity. And that's because it'll switch to the internal Intel graphics that consume less power. But if you're editing video or playing games or doing something that's really pushing the hardware more significantly, you're not gonna get that much battery life out of this one. So these gaming laptops at this price point are great performers provided they are plugged in. If they are not plugged in, you're not gonna get all that much life out of them. But I do think for the price point, you'll see the performance here is probably worth the trade-off of having to keep a plug nearby to get everything going. Now what I wanna do is take a look at some games we played on it. I've got a bunch that we tested on a live stream the other day, so let's have a look at some popular titles. So we're gonna begin with Red Dead Redemption 2. This is running at 1080p at the lowest settings, and we were seeing that we were consistently above 90 frames per second most of the time, so if we wanted to improve image quality, we could do that and likely stay north of 60 frames per second. Some of the lower end GPUs in the Victus line, of course, won't perform at this level, but I do think you should be able to get 60 frames per second at least out of most of them, uh, provided you keep the settings down and you can always adjust things to get it to where it looks and plays best for you. We also checked out No Man's Sky. This one is always fun to play around with because it is a procedurally generated game, so things are always different. And here we're getting about 140-ish frames per second. Uh, this is running the game at standard settings, basically the low setting for this game. And you'll see that frame rate jump around a little bit when we get into the water and stuff, but by and large it was north of 90 frames per second most of the time, and of course very playable at that frame rate. And if we wanted to, we could bump up the image quality here too. Doom Eternal, running at lowest settings, 1080p, was giving us about 120 to 130 frames per second, as you can see here. Looked and played great, so uh, that was a fun experience. And we also checked out The Ascent, which is a Game Pass game I've been playing around with. Uh, this one I set to ultra settings just to see how it would do. And here at 1080p, as you can see, we were in the 100 frames per second territory. So great performance on this one. This game looks pretty cool, too. I also looked at Star Wars Squadrons, which is a game that usually runs pretty well on lower end computers, and here it was no exception. So I boosted the settings up to ultra, and as you can see here, we're in that 100 frames per second territory here as well. A really fun experience uh, with one of my favorite Star Wars games of late here. So altogether, a pretty good gaming experience for sure. Uh, the 3060 model here should also do well with VR. Pretty much any of the GPU options can drive a VR headset, but you probably want to get a little higher end on the GPU decision if you are looking to play modern VR games. A lot of the older ones will run fine on the lower end hardware, but some of the newer ones are starting to get more demanding. So look at the 3060 if you do intend to do VR, but this one can certainly handle that. And on the 3D Mark Time Spy benchmark test, we got a score of 7,357. And if you compare that to the Dell XPS 9710, which has the same configuration inside, you can see that this laptop performs the same as one that costs a lot more. The difference, of course, with that Dell is that it's much more luxurious, it's got a nicer display, it's got better battery life, it's all metal. But if you're willing to give up some of those creature comforts, you can get the same performance on something like this. Also going back to the chart there, you can see a computer equipped with a 3050, which is also an option on this one. 
uh, along with a machine that's got one of the 1650 GPUs on board. So that'll give you an idea as to some of the performance steps that you can make when deciding which one of these models to purchase. And again, the one we're looking at today has the higher end GPU inside. We also ran the 3D Mark stress test and there we got a passing score of 99.2%, a very good score actually. You can also see the temperature of the CPU and GPU at the conclusion of that test. And what that tells me is that we're not gonna see a lot of thermal throttling on this one. So it will generally perform the same even over a long period of time running a demanding game. So good performance here overall. Additionally, we got Linux running on it as you can see here. This is Ubuntu 21.10. Video is working, audio is working, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and networking are working here. Also, the NVIDIA GPU was detected. So if you did want to play around a little bit with an alternative operating system, you should be able to do that on here without too many issues. All the hardware here got detected automatically. So altogether, I think this is a pretty good value depending on the configuration you choose. You don't get some of the luxury accoutrements of a more expensive computer. You've got a bit of a wobbly display here, but it performs exceptionally well for its price point. And if you're looking for just performance with something that you can lug around with you, uh, this is definitely worth considering. I think it's a nicely equipped machine for its price tag. That is going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Hot Sauce and Video Games, Brian Parker, Chris Allegretta, Tom Albrecht, Thomas Anfang, Jim Tannis, and Handheld Obsession. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.